Now, poor old Martin, he's lost somewhere in the middle of the Simpson Desert. Who knows where, whether he'll ever get back? But, um, <laughs> I'm <say> that. <laughs> it's a great privilege. Now, I'm going to be speaking. It's, it's Mission Month, I believe, but I'm here today to speak to you about your mission, not the mission that's out there, but your mission individually as you seek to share the, the message of Jesus. And so the passage I have for us today, if you have a Bible and you'd like to open it up, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'll be reading from verse 13. Oh, so here it is. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Now, since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore we speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Well, my verse I want to be focused on this morning is verse 13 from that chapter that I just read to you. It says this, It is written, says Paul, now he's, he's quoting from Psalm uh, and 16. He's quoting from something that was written in the Old Testament. He quotes this. He said, the quote is, I believe, therefore I have spoken. And then Paul says this about it. He says, since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe, and therefore we speak. Believe, therefore we speak. So, according to Paul, what he's saying to us there and to the people back in the is that we are meant to, to speak out our faith. If we believe it, we're meant to speak it. We're meant to believe out loud. We're not meant to hold it in and keep it to ourselves. Now, the question I want to answer this morning what does it mean? to believe out loud in a world that is increasingly telling us to sit down and shut up. <laughs> what does it mean to speak out our faith sensitively and effectively in a society that actually is now starting to accuse us of intolerance when we do so? Uh, this is, in fact, the topic of my latest book, Believing Out Loud, Helping Timid Christians Open up about their faith. Oh, you like the picture of the little doggy? I don't know if you can see it. It's this little doggy with his hands over his eyes, wanting to hide away from the world. Um, and so this is the topic I want to talk to us about today because I'm really passionate about this. I think this is a topic that the church really urgently needs to consider because the world is changing. You probably noticed. And I think Christians are becoming increasingly uncertain and fearful about sharing their faith in the world today. We're worried about offending. We're worried about being accused of intolerance and hate speech. And, of course, all of this is being driven by the rapidly increasing hostility toward Christianity within our society. Western society is turning against Christianity. You can see it everywhere. And, and it's a very recent ph phenomenon because for centuries previously, the Christian faith was respected and valued. Uh, it was, in fact, a central pillar of society. Uh, the Bible was the basis of modern ethics. It was the foundation of most modern constitutions. And although not everyone in society engaged specifically and directly, the church was still held in very high esteem. It led the way in charity, in welfare work. It made significant contributions to education and, and uh, health care. It uh, had a powerful voice in guiding legislation. Its leaders were listened to at national level and international level. It was a significant pillar of 
society, but all that is changing. And it's changing very rapidly. Over the last few decades, we've witnessed the rapid deterioration of Christianity's previously respected uh, position within society. Now, several factors are going on in our world. You're probably aware of most of them. The rise of militant atheism, the rise of secularism, the increasing voice and political power of the LGBTQI movement, the gay movement, as well as the influx of multiculturalism and other religions. And all of these have, have, have resulted in Christianity being pushed to the side. As well as all those external factors, Christianity hasn't helped itself either. Abuse by church leaders, high-profile ministers falling into adultery and financial fraud, and the hints just seem to keep on coming. And the result of all this is that Christianity now has a huge image problem. In many people's minds, we've lost all credibility. They simply don't want to hear from us anymore. And any Christians who dare to speak out about their faith, about their beliefs and values now, often find themselves subject to anger and mockery on social media. Some are even finding themselves in court. Discrimination against Christians in the workforce is on the rise with a growing number of cases where Christians have either lost their jobs because of their beliefs or are being expressly forbidden to voice their views in the workplace. So in essence, what I'm saying to you, I'm painting a pretty grim picture here, aren't I? But it's, it's really what's going on in our world and we need to wake up to it and we need to really be aware of what's happening. In essence, Christians are now being made to feel guilty for being Christian. For holding to beliefs, and here's the crazy thing, for holding to beliefs and values that until very recently have been accepted and been the pillar of society, but now are mocked and increasingly viewed as repressive and outdated. Now, I haven't said anything to you this morning that you don't already know. You are all aware of what's going on. You've all felt it. Perhaps you've already experienced some of this yourself, this pushback at a personal level. And the result of all this, I think, is that many Christians, maybe most Christians, are now fearful and worried about believing out loud. What are we to do about this? How do we believe out loud in such a hostile world now? Well, I want to make a few brief points in response to that question. And the first thing I want to say to you, and the most important thing really is, that in one sense, nothing much has really changed, at least in the long view. Things really haven't changed all that much. I want to take you back 3,000 years now. The writer of Psalm 119, writing about 3,000 years ago, was apparently being mocked and taunted for his faith. And this is what he writes in verses 41 and 42. Have a listen to what he says. He says, Lord, may your unfailing love come to me, your salvation according to your promise. Then I can answer everyone who taunts me. For I trust in your word. Never take your word of truth from my mouth. That's an interesting statement. So he's being taunted for his faith in God. He's being mocked, and he prays, Lord, never take your words from my mouth. That's interesting, isn't it? Not from my head or my heart. More than that, keep your words, Lord, in my mouth. Help me to keep speaking out my faith, even though I am mocked, even though I am taunted and ridiculed. Help me to believe out loud when I am persecuted. It's a really relevant verse for us. Now, of course, moving ahead a thousand years to the time of the first church, Christian church, the early Christian church in the first century had it even worse than that and worse than us. Uh, the Bible passage that we just read from 1 Corinthians chapter 4 uh, was urging those Christians to believe out loud 
And it was written to a church that was experiencing much worse persecution than we currently are in this country. Some of them were being arrested and even killed for their faith. It was written to a church in Corinth, a part of the Roman Empire, and persecution against Christians was ramping up to the point where Nero was uh, arresting people, the emperor was throwing them into the Colosseum and killing them as a spectator sport. And to those first century Christians, this is what the Apostle Paul writes. Now, I'm going to read a few verses prior to our Bible reading. Now, let me just give you the picture of what was going on, because this is what Paul writes to them. He says, we had this treasure in jars of clay. We're talking about the gospel and the presence of salvation within ourselves. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And here, then he describes what they're going through. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Uh, we're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive, and here's another important thing he writes, are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So these people are really under intense persecution, even at times being given over to death. And so he says to these people, what's his advice to these people? Hunker down and lock your doors, stay inside, don't go out, don't, don't tell anyone about your faith because you're in mortal danger. No, this is what he writes. This is what he says to these people. He says in verse 13, We believe, therefore we speak. We believe, therefore we speak. We can't help but speak. Keep believing out loud, he says to them. Don't be silenced by the world. Don't be bullied into silence. But I wonder... Did you notice in the passage that was read out uh, that Paul then gives two reasons why they should keep believing out loud? Two reasons. The first um, is, is in that, well, they're both in the next two verses. So let me read from halfway through verse 13 and go through these two reasons. He says halfway through verse 13, We believe, therefore we speak, because... Maybe you see because in the scriptures you know that there's an important reason coming. Because, verse 14, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself. In other words, we should keep speaking about Jesus because one day we will stand in his presence and give an account of our lives to him. And we want to be able to stand in his presence on that day and know that we have faithfully proclaimed him as Lord, even when it was tough. Remember your looming appointment with Jesus, says the Apostle Paul, and let that motivate you to be faithful. He then gives the second reason why we should Believe out loud. And it's, it's found in the next verse, verse 15. He says, All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. That phrase, the grace that is reaching more and more people. Paul is talking here about people being saved in response to the gospel. He's reminding his listeners that it's worth it to push through opposition, to keep believing out loud, because some people will actually respond and be saved for eternity. And that will result, according to Paul's own words here in verse 15, in thanksgiving, overflowing to the glory of God. So, uh, I was thinking about this verse uh, earlier on in the week and I thought to myself, what, if, what is the primary motivation here that's going on in Paul's heart? And I thought, well, it's compassion, isn't it? It's compassion for the lost. 
that he's talking about here, really. And he's saying compassion for the lost, the desire to see more and more people be saved, is the thing that should help us overcome our fear. Here's the principle I want to share. I want to leave with you very strongly this morning. Compassion overcomes fear. Compassion overcomes fear. Let me give you an illustration. I want you to imagine this scenario. Suppose you're walking along the bank of a river in the middle of winter, uh, and it's a very steep bank, a steep drop off into a very deep uh, river that's running very fast, dangerous currents. It's freezing cold. It's sleep blowing. The water is barely above freezing. Now, if you're walking along that river bank with a friend and a friend's head, friend said to you, I dare you to jump into that river fully clothed. I don't think there'd, there'd be many of us who are reasonably sensible human beings who would decide to do that. We would be rightly and justifiably concerned, even afraid, of the current and the cold. You just wouldn't do it. But let me throw another little twist into the story. As you're walking along that riverbank, you see a young child, a boy of only two or three, wander away from his, from his mother and walk towards the riverbank, just a few metres from where you, where you are. And before you can even shout a warning, the little boy loses his footing and he plunges into the river and he goes straight down below the surface and disappears. Now, if you're a half-decent human being, you would not stop to think, not for a second, you would immediately jump into that river and fully close in order to save that child. What's happened in that scenario? The factors that gave rise to your initial fear about jumping into the river are still all there. Nothing has changed. The water is still freezing. The sleet's still falling. The river currents are still dangerous. Nothing has changed in that sense. You are still, in fact, justified in being fearful of those things. Your fear remains but it has been overcome by a much more powerful motivator, compassion. The urgent need to save someone overcomes your fear and pushes that to the background. And as you jump into that freezing water, you're still afraid for yourself, but compassion has helped you overcome that fear. Uh, this, this actually happened to me many years ago. Except I was the child. The circumstances were slightly different. My father and my uncle were rowing a boat up a river. I was only two years old and uh, for some reason they'd taken me with them. Uh, it was the middle of winter, it was freezing cold, my father was rowing and my uncle was the passenger and I was playing around in the bottom of the row boat. I'm not sure what I was doing, I'm not even sure why they took me. But uh, suddenly, without any warning, I stood up leaned over the side of the boat and fell headlong into the freezing water, disappearing instantly beneath the surface. My father, who was rowing, didn't see. Uh, but my uncle did. And without a moment's hesitation, he dived into the river, fully clothed, to rescue me. Uh, the fact that I'm standing here today before you says that he was successful. <laughs> uh, there might be some people who are rather disappointed in that. <laughs> anyway, here I stand nonetheless. Now, I don't remember uh, that event at all, but it, it has been recounted to me uh, several times by my family. My uncle ruined a perfectly good watch and was, pro and was miserably cold for the rest of the day. <laughs> Compassion and the desire to save a life motivated him to overcome his fear and his discomfort. Uh, brothers and sisters, that, that's a picture. Uh, of what you and I need to embrace ourselves. We need that same compassion for those who are outside of Christ. We need to see that the danger that they face, right, their looming judgment before the king of the universe, the danger they face is far more serious than the slight risk that you and I face of being ridiculed or abused. Compassion ought to motivate us, to put aside our fears, to gird our loins with courage and to believe out loud. Now let me ask you a question. Is it possible, is it possible 
that the reason why we are sometimes reluctant to believe out loud is not because we have too much fear, but because we may have too little compassion. Is it possible? And could our lack of concern for the lost, in turn, be the result of us not being sufficiently focused on eternal things, things of an eternal nature? Could it be that we are not aware enough about the eternal significance of life? Listen to how Paul finishes the passage that I read to you. Because he draws his reader's attention finally to that eternal significance. And, and effectively he's saying you need to have compassion on those people because there's something much more dangerous and important that's facing them. Listen to his words in verses 16 to 18. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, so outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Now he starts to speak of the eternal perspective. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. The fire outweighs them all. And so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What he's saying to, to them and to us is that there are eternal issues at stake. People's eternities are in the balance. And so out of compassion, we need to press through our fear and our discomfort and be daring enough to believe out loud. Now, I can hear your questions by murmuring away in the depths of your minds. That's all well and good for you to say that, Kevin. But how do we do it? How do we speak our faith out loud in a world that no longer wants to listen? And it's certainly true. Our world is changing. And we need to change with it. The way, and I'm absolutely convinced about this, the way we believe out loud today needs to be different. It needs to change from the way we used to. Um, and I will, I will give it an outrageous plug for my book at this point. Because in, in, in my book, Believing Out Loud, I explore how we need to change our message. How we need to go about believing out loud. And how we need to express our faith in a world that is increasingly hostile. How do we express our faith in a way that's not intolerant, that's not hateful and judgmental? Uh, I've got a, a whole lot of very practical suggestions. Very simple, very practical suggestions about how to share your faith in a hostile world respectfully, naturally, and effectively. Can I just read to you a couple of chapter headings? Because I think you find them helpful. Um, tolerance and evangelism. Uh, overcoming fear with compassion, which is really what I've spoken to you about this morning. Being a link in the chain, you don't have to be the last link, you just have to be a link. That's liberating. Being a witness and not an expert, that's, a, that's liberating as well. Building genuine friendships. What is our message? The art of natural conversation. How to bring the gospel into everyday conversation in a way that's not threatening or forced. Listening and asking questions, telling stories about Jesus, answering the hard questions, being the last link, if you ever had that privilege, and dropping breadcrumbs. A whole lot of helpful things for you. That's as much as I'm going to say about it. it it's there and it's available. They're, they're $20 each. Uh, I wish I could give you all a free copy. I really do. But um, I have to buy them myself. Uh, $20 each. We did take a uh, credit card. And also, you know that paper stuff we used to in shop papers, you know that stuff? We also, we also uh, you can take that as well. But I'm going to finish now. Um, and there's a bunch of other books over there too, by the way. You can have a look at that. I'm going to finish now, though, with the words of Scripture once again. 
from 1 Corinthians 4, verses 13 to 15. We're going to start again, halfway through verse 13. Let's let these words be the last words we consider from this message this morning. We believe and therefore we speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself. So that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Amen. Let me, uh, let me practice just for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for firstly opening our hearts and minds and eyes to see and understand and respond to the gospel. We thank you so much that you have shone the light of your gospel into our hearts, that you've rescued us from, uh, from an eternity of, of darkness and despair. We thank you that you have plucked us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the wonderful kingdom of light. Father God, please fill us with such a passion uh, to reach the lost, with such compassion for their state, that we might overcome our own reluctance and fear and discomfort. We pray, dear God, that you would give us great courage and wisdom, and that by your Holy Spirit you will open opportunities with our friends and neighbours. Our relatives. We pray more than that, that you would help us to look for opportunity. Father, help us to go out of our way, to make this the, the, the burning desire of our hearts and the primary focus of our lives, to be your faithful witnesses in a world that desperately needs you. So we ask for your courage, your strength, your uh, empowering Holy Spirit to abide with us and work through us, so that others Come to know the Lord Jesus as well and brought into the, the wonderful kingdom of your son. We pray this in Jesus. Amen. Amen.